Hey, how's it going? So there's a fun concept called the Kardashev scale. Imagine Dragon Ball Z power levels, but for alien civilizations. The concept's a little weird and sometimes slightly misunderstood. I suppose that's fair though. It is an unusual idea. You wouldn't rank how good your friends are based on how many electrical sockets they have in their house, but that's kind of what the Kardashev scale does. So if you've got any cool nerd friends and they keep dropping K-bombs with a hard V and you're not sure how to respond, let me give you some advice. All right, so what is the Kardashev scale? The Kardashev scale classifies civilizations like human civilization or hypothetical alien civilizations based on their capacity to harness and use energy. Originally, it was Russian astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev that came up with this idea back in the 1960s. So the idea is it has three levels. There's a type one, or sometimes called a Kardashev one civilization capable of harnessing all the energy available on its home planet. There's a type two civilization, which can harness all the energy of an entire star. And there's a type three civilization, which is a civilization that can harness the energy of its entire galaxy. Each step represents an enormous increase in power usage. Type 1 is about 10 to the power of 16 watts, Type 2 is about 10 to the power of 26 watts, and Type 3 is about 10 to the power of 36 watts. Advancing from one to another takes a lot of time, and it requires an increase in scientific and technological understanding, as well as an increase in a civilization's general industrial capacity to actually build things on a massive scale. Now this model has changed a bit over time. It started as a pretty simple affair with K1, K2, and K3, and that was it. But a bunch of other folks have come and added stuff as the decades have rolled by. Turns out K1, K2 and K3 are all separated by about 10 orders of magnitude, so Carl Sagan came up with a logarithmic formula which lets you figure out exactly what stage your civilization is at down to the decimal point. Fun fact, we are at K0.73-ish right now, which makes it sound like we're kinda close to K1, but unfortunately the amount of wattage you need to increase your level increases as you go up, so we're not actually that close. A big farm is probably like a 0.2 on its own. The ancient Roman Empire was probably like a 0.4, humanity in the Victorian period was like a 0.6. We harness about 18 terawatts of energy globally right now, meaning we're currently just shy of being a K0.75 civilization, and assuming our energy generation capacity increases by about 3% per year, which is more or less what you'd expect, we'll hit K1 within a century or two. Of course, that does require us to either cover the entire planet in solar panels or start doing a whole lot more nuclear, preferably fusion. I can just imagine aliens looking at us now. Sir, I have returned with a detailed report on the human- um, sir? Oh, uh, hey? I return with a detailed report on the humans. Oh, sick, yeah, let me see. Internet? What's that? It is the beginnings of a global communications network. Oh, nice. But they mostly use it for pornography. Hmm, okay, okay. Oh, nuclear power, that's good. They mostly use that for weaponry. What the hell is wrong with these guys? More than a few things. To be fair, their star system did form from that one nebula the Protheans dumped all of their asbestos into. I take it the fact they're not using nuclear power means they're already constructing their first star stickle? Well, they would refer to it as a Dyson swarm, but, uh, no. Their energy usage report is on the other side. Alrighty, let me take a look. Kardashev 0.7? We drove 23 million parsecs for a Kardashev 0.7. What the shit, man? Sir, if you could please just finish reading the report. F yeah, I'm reading it. They use windmills and burn dead shit. What are they, f***ing Space Amish? Should I take this as an indication that we shall not be enabling their ascension to join the Galactic Federation? Nah, f*** them. So yeah, we're still a ways off type 1. I looked at how much energy humanity uses as a percentage of the total solar power hitting the Earth, and we are at less than 0.03% right now, so our power plants are going to have to get substantially beefier before we are anywhere near the K1 threshold. There are other ways that the Kardashev model has changed over time too. K1, 2, and 3 have been expanded to include K0, as a natural result of Sagan's formula being a continuous thing. So a K0 would basically be a tribe with enough felled timber to keep a few big fires burning simultaneously. And there's potential potential for a K4, K5, K6, K17 and a half, K114. You can just kind of think of a number and put the word Kardashev or type in front of it, but anything above a K3 is always kind of hazy to me. I'd assume a K4 is roughly equivalent to a civilization harnessing all the power of every star in the observable universe. I think the maths roughly checks out on that one, but realistically at sub-light speeds, which realistically are the only speeds we're ever going to be traveling at unless we science our way to basically discovering magic at some point in the future, there's no way to access most of those galaxies, so my rough 
rough assumption would be something like a 3.5 being probably the biggest civilization physically possible given the physics of our universe. I've heard people say that K4 is a universal civilization, K5 is an interdimensional or multiversal civilization, and K6 is omniversal, etc, etc. I'ma be real with you, Chief. Anything above a K4 is totally made up. Listen, I get it. I stare into the sky longing to be chirally inverted by hyperdimensional babes as much as the next guy, but K5 and onwards are just cosmological fan fiction, alright? Chill out. Sorry to interrupt, this is just a quick message to say, statistically speaking, you're probably not subscribed, so I'll make you a deal. Press the subscribe button and I won't come over to your house and do this. Alright, thanks. Back to the video. Now when this model says that K1 means to harness all the energy available on your planet, what it's actually saying is harnessing all the solar energy hitting the planet, or the equivalent of all the solar energy hitting the planet. That might seem kind of arbitrary, but bear in mind, basically everything that happens on the Earth is solar powered. Oh, not everything, Zan. What about the machinery and the cars and stuff? We barely even use solar power. What about oil and coal? Proper energy, not gay leftist liberal energy. Oh, you mean the dead stuff that stored up its energy that it got via photosynthesis, which is to say it absorbed its energy from the sun, which is to say it's solar power with extra steps. You're gonna have to try harder than that, shit ass. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not solar powered. I eat meat exclusively. Oh, I was thinking of congratulating you on your obvious pregnancy, but I guess that's just a gigantic tube of meat being transmogrified into an ultra-dense log of turbo shit I can see writhing in the lower half of your torso. Anyway, you eat meat, which used to be an animal, which ate plants, which photosynthesized. Sun wins again, baby. Anyway, my point is that the Kardashev scale is calibrated to the amount of energy hitting the Earth as sunlight at K1. So reach K1 doesn't demand you turn your entire planet's matter content into pure energy or something. If we did that, presumably by firing a second planet made of antimatter at the Earth, that would produce a very K2 amount of energy. Popular science fiction often depicts interstellar empires spanning entire galaxies, which you might think indicates Type 3 status. However, many such stories rely on faster than light travel, which as I mentioned before, I don't think is super likely. It would be dope, but no, it's in the same category as anti-gravity and time travel and perpetual motion machines, which is to say it would be very cool but there will forever be people saying there's a big breakthrough right around the corner and then nothing ever, ever, ever actually happens because it's fundamentally just not going to. Anyway, galactic empires in fiction often function at energy levels closer to type 1 or early type 2. The scope of an empire in space does not necessarily equate to energy mastery, which is what the Kardashev scale is actually measuring. Think of it this way, a type 1 needs to harness the equivalent of all the solar energy hitting their home planet. If they covered the whole thing in solar panels, they wouldn't have anywhere to fucking live. The same concept kind of carries through for the other stages. A K1 has probably colonized most of its star system. A K2 is probably already really good at interstellar travel. A K3 probably has intergalactic travel. And no, before you start, that doesn't mean that K4 gets into universal travel, you little shit. I mean, if we aren't reaching K1 for a century or two, you, well, like, don't you think we'll have space colonies by then? Habitats on the moon or Mars or whatever within the next century or two? I'm not one of these guys that says that we'll be on Mars in five years or something, but I think one or two hundred years would be fairly pessimistic. We say K1 is planetary, K2 is stellar, and K3 is galactic, but those words just indicate the level of energy mastery, not living in a place. We already live all over the Earth, so by that metric, we'd already be a planetary civilization, at least if you add all of our little tribes together. One criticism of the Kardashev scale is that it focuses solely on energy consumption, potentially overlooking the role of information processing and efficiency. Like, energy consumption seems like a decent measure of civilizational advancement at first glance, right? There were no cavemen running NVIDIA GeForce RTX 590s back in 10,000 BC, because where are they going to plug it in? They're going to harness a f***ing lightning strike? Some argue that advanced civilizations may prioritise computational capability rather than just raw energy, and they could even minimise their energy footprint on purpose to avoid detection, or for ecological reasons. Now, I would disagree with that particular reasoning, but an argument for using processing power instead does sort of make sense, I think. You know, you could have a multi-galactic civilization with a few trillion Dyson spheres all powering a single crocodile clip attached to someone's nipples, and it would technically count as a K3, but is it hyper-advanced in the way that K3 heavily implies? So intelligence may manifest more through information processing density, like using matryoshka brains or quantum computation or something, rather than by building massive energy structures. But then again, that computation does need to run on something, and if you've got the technology to do that, I don't know why you'd be running it on a power source that isn't a Dyson Swarm. And also, you could just use all that computation to run a hyper-realistic simulation of someone frying their own nipples, so that's still not really a perfect solution either. Tell me what alternative measure of civilizational advancement you'd use. Should we rank humanity in hyper
hypothetical alien civilizations based on their energy use, processing power, fastest spaceship, largest Pokemon card collection, best drip? Let me know. Anyway, the Kardashev scale is sort of useful in informing our search for extraterrestrial civilizations by estimating the energy signatures of advanced civilizations such as excess infrared radiation from Dyson-like structures. Astronomers can develop hypotheses about where to search for technological civilizations and what they might look like. In other words, we know for certain that our galaxy is not home to a K3 civilization because the Earth would be inside their f***ing living room, but there could hypothetically be K2s hidden around somewhere that we haven't found. We definitely wouldn't see them if they were hidden in that super secret part of the galaxy we can't see. Personally, I'd still rate this as a little unlikely, but it certainly is possible. And extragalactically, we couldn't really see K2s because they'd be too far away and too small, but we could see K3s pretty easily. In either case, we'd be looking for stars or galaxies which are way less bright in the visual range than they should be, but way brighter than normal in the infrared due to all the waste heat they'd be kicking out. In both cases, we've not found anything, but it's worth keeping an eye out. Anyway, that'll do it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Like and subscribe if you want, and an extra big thank you to all my Elite Level channel members, Thunderbolt 22A10, who exclusively communicates in riddles, which is inconvenient when he's trying to do his taxes, Greg Santiago, who synchronized the tides to align with his sleeping patterns, and Yannick Spath, who's been using his cosmic powers to secretly rearrange constellations into increasingly obscure memes over the last few millennia. Thanks as well to my other channel members. If you're still watching, feel free to join the channel too. I've got a bunch of cool YouTube membership perks, you know, a Discord server, emotes, a desktop wallpaper, that kind of stuff. Anyways, as always, I'll catch you in the next one. Over and out.